This is Ribchester in Lancashire. It's a typical bit of tranquil, peaceful English countryside, isn't it? But imagine what it would have been like to have been stuck up here in midwinter if you were an ordinary Roman foot soldier. This place would have been the last outpost of the Empire, a really barbarian place where the only thing that stood between you and instant death at the hands of some maniac Brit tribesman who'd been wound up into a frenzy by his local druid and sent herring down this hillside would have been your fighting skills and your fort and that little river over there. So how did they protect themselves? Did they just march up here in 43 AD when Claudius invaded and build a big fort and then march out again 250 years later? Or did they constantly have to adapt their tactics depending on local conditions and local politics? Well, we hope that part of the answer to that will be in someone's back garden, a local resident who's written a letter to this week's Time Team. Dear Time Team, as a retired history teacher, I've always taken a keen interest in Ribchester's past. I'd like to know more about the Roman remains in my garden and about the earlier Roman defences of the town. Yours sincerely, Jim Ridge, Ribchester. This week's time team are Mick Aston, Bristol University landscape archaeologist, Carenza Lewis, Royal Commission on Historic Monuments, Phil Harding, Wessex Archaeological Trust, field archaeologist, Robin Bush, archivist, and Victor Ambrose, historical illustrator. Right, two and a half days in which to unravel the Roman defences of Ribchester. How are we going to do that? Well, the, the, the early Roman defences that uh, Mr Ridge refers to there, there's been some work done already. We know that there's ditches out here and out here. And I think if we um, go for those, perhaps with some geophysics and possibly even cut the odd trench across, mm. I think we should be able to tell quite a lot about that. But you're, you're, you're missing the point of his garden. He's got some Roman remains in his garden, and as far as I can see, it's, what is it, just up here in the corner mm. here. I mean, that's what he's asked us to have a look at. I want to get mm. round there and have a look at it. I don't know many people with Roman remains in their <laughs> gardens. <laughs> But all, all these different bits we've been looking at, they're all on different bits of paper. They're all different excavations at different times. Yeah. I think we need to make a map to get everything onto one piece of paper so we can see exactly what's going on, Plus everything related to each other. Yeah. What do you mean? Yeah. Yeah. This plan isn't, isn't reliable? Well, it's just there's a lot of different bits and pieces. They've all been sort of conjectured together. I think we can get everything mm. carefully drawn on one, one sheet of paper. We'll be able to give Mr Ridge a nice sort of clear plan of what happened when. Right, well, yeah. we've got 72 hours in which to do that, after which time... We'll have to present our findings to the people of Ribchester. And we'll, uh, actually, it doesn't leave very much time at all to do it, does it? Ribchester in Lancashire lies midway between Preston and Clitheroe. Situated on the banks of the River Ribble, it's always been a major strategic site. In Roman times, it guarded both the river crossing and the main route to the north. As Carenza said, there's been a lot of archaeological work here over the years, but most of it has concentrated on the stone fort and the later years of Roman occupation after about 150 AD. Time Team, in addition to exploring the stone fort in Jim Ridge's garden, want to focus on the earlier period of Roman activity around 70 AD, when Ribchester would have been a Roman frontier town. How long have you been living here? Oh, since 1977. Yeah? But, uh, Did you? Good God. Time goes that. back a long, long way further than that. Because uh, I first uh, helped with a dig in Ribchester when I was 15. Did, did you? Did, over was 40 all this years ago. Then? Was all this Well, year then? under the ground, under the ground. But the plan of the fort's well known. Yeah? And I knew when I bought this place that there was part of the fort here, but we didn't know it was so well preserved. Oh, no, marvellous. Mm. Obviously, it'd be nice to be able to clean up and have a look at the floor and, and see what yeah. fixtures and fittings and there might see, be in there. Obviously, we could do with the professional team to answer the it's remaining nice. problems. Yeah, it'd be nice. And then we yeah. can further conserve the remains. Let's get going. Let's get on with it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, here's another one, look, Tony. This, this road, again, has got one of these sort of gentle curves on it. We ought to have a look at these on the maps because 
if, if, if we were coming here without knowing what has been done locally, these are just the things I'd be looking for as clues to the corners of Roman forts. Uh, you know, this does a gentle curve round, like as if it's going round defences on, on that side. This isn't a question of uh, an archaeologist looking for the smallest <laughs> wiggle in a road to well, justify... We do, we do do that. We look for small wiggles in roads because roads go more or less direct from A to B. If they do anything else, then they're not doing what they're supposed to do. And there's usually a good reason that the course of them has been altered at some stage. And it's often because they've gone round defences, you know, they've gone round uh, banks and ditches. So if there was that, if that corner really was part of the Roman defences, then they ought to find some sort of yeah. foundations of a corner tower. That's yeah. right, that's yeah. right. If it was, I mean, it may be that it was... Uh, that's where we're going. Ah, I think so. Oh, yes, here they are. Hiya. Ah, it's Chris Hiya. and John. Oh, hello. How are you doing, then? Yeah, OK. OK. You Good. started? See you again. You? See you again. Good. Sorry. <laughs> what, uh, what have you decided to do? Well, we understand this is the area where actually wants us to do the first work yeah. uh, to try yeah. and locate this outer ditch. Yeah. Um, which, they, when they were doing the small excavations a few years ago, in advance of the residential home. That's right, they, 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 found, they found a ditch through. more or less in this alignment across yeah. here, that uh, uh, outside the sort of Vicus or village outside the main fort. Yeah. Mm. So if they found um, a ditch already, why are we bothering to poke around here? Well, one thing, they only found a little bit of it, so we need to see where it's going and quite what course it's taking. And uh, without digging thousands of trenches all over the place, uh, a geophysical survey would hopefully get yeah, to that. I mean, are the, are the conditions good well, so far? Or? Well, the, the geological conditions are quite difficult for yeah. the sort of techniques we use, but you know, there's, there's still some hope. <laughs> That's just we, cover, isn't it? <laughs> no, 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 we, we, so despite the conditions, the geophysics team start to survey the field. The hope is that their equipment will be able to detect the remains of the ditches hidden under the ground. Carenza is busy surveying the key sites in order to plot them accurately on her new map. And in Jim's garden, the dig to expose the floor of the guard tower is now truly underway. Why were these defences necessary? Who were the Romans afraid of? Well, not these two. This is Victor's idea to try to show what the local tribe would have looked like. Thank you, Victor. The enemy, if you like, were the Brigantes. They occupied more territory than any other single tribe, or in their case, group of peoples. So that's, that's a huge area when you're thinking in terms of Roman Britain. And Ribchester was just one of those forts that they built uh, in order to, well, keep the natives at bay, keep the people under control. And they built them to a kind of pattern. Uh, and here, the, there is the, uh, the perfect uh, outline uh, of a Roman fort built according to the manual. And we've got various descriptions. I mean, there's a, there's a wonderful uh, account in this bloke, Vegetius, on how to build your Roman fort by numbers, almost. You get, for instance, the sorts of fortification of a camp. There are three different sorts of fortification. When there is no pressing danger, turves are cut from the earth, and from them a kind of wall is built three feet high above the ground. He even says it's advisable always to have in readiness mattocks, rakes, baskets, and other kinds of tools. <laughs> this is amazing, isn't it? It's like a, this real Roman textbook that still exists today. This marvellous, marvellous cobbled surface, and that's the, the bottom of your excavation, that's is it? That's the layer that we got down to, and we didn't penetrate into it because we didn't want to uh, damage what was in situ. How much of this cobbled area did you get exposed? Well, I think to the left here. I think where Patrick is scraping down there, that is the, um, that's the rubble from the inside of the uh, guard right. tower. I think yeah. there he's down to the undisturbed right. uh, Roman right. level. So that everything this way you dug out before, yes, that explains where we've been upper finding surface has a been lot of plastic. This <laughs> we is we're in the back uh, entrance, right. uh, we're in, in the entrance of, right. the, uh, of the guard tower. Right. Of course, for centuries, people have been rooting through this material, stealing the dress stone for their 
houses, just as my cottage there is uh, built almost entirely from the reused stone from the rampart. This is brilliant stuff. One should find out how soldiers are feeling before battle. Yeah. Explore carefully how soldiers are feeling on the actual day that they're going to fight. For confidence or fear may be discerned from their facial expression, their language, gait and gestures. Mm. Do not be fully confident if it's the recruits who want battle, for war is sweet to the inexperienced. <laughs> That's great, great stuff, then. isn't it? I was, honestly, you just open any page. Any page, and just, yeah, yeah. Here we are. Right. Bit of uh, Roman architecture? Yeah, it probably is, though. Well, yeah, because, I mean, Ooh. these these places are great. Look at this. The great quarries, you know, when they're abandoned, and it almost certainly is. I mean, that and the plinth look, uh, and the top, that, these other tops probably have replacements. But, yeah, I mean, people pinching stuff, you know, the ruins are falling to pieces, people helping themselves, it probably is. I was taking the mickey, I thought no, it was no, a bit of Georgian no, or something. No, no, I think that's okay. It's are. okay. A bit of Roman? I bet the whole place is full of bits like that. <laughs> We've actually done some work in the field where we saw you earlier trying to find this uh, early ditch and we've done a magnetic survey and a resistance survey and as we suggested at the time conditions aren't brilliant for the techniques but we've actually come up with some positive results, quite exciting results we feel. Yeah. Um, I've got a couple of the early field plots uh, and one I've actually marked the, the line of the ditch where we, we've got a waterlogged ditch and low resistance readings. This is the actual line of the ditch. Yeah. You can see it curving can quite see nicely. quite clearly on here, actually, can't you? Yeah. Still and we're, we're getting there. high readings yeah. inside the black areas. Could that be sort of bank and buildings? Bank, bank and buildings is buildings, quite yeah. likely. So where are we going to dig? Um, Would it be better curve. on the curve, do you reckon, rather than on the straight? Section. Yeah. A section across it, perhaps? Uh, yeah, I mean, mm. I guess it might be a little bit more interesting somewhere near the corner, but... Uh, pays your money and your takes your yeah. choice on a job like that, doesn't you? You've drawn a purple curve, but to my untutored eye, uh, this line seems to go straight on as well as curving round. Yes, uh, you're actually right. I mean, there, there are hints of maybe a further ditch continuing in this direction. Is it worth sort of trying to concentrate on putting another trench maybe there to get an idea of the line that it sets off in? Well, presumably you're going to do some more work well, anyway. We're going John. to do some more yeah. survey work yeah. and we've got clear evidence of a curving ditch. But that might be the place mm. to dig, mightn't it, where you've got a uh, you know, possible straight line. The intersection the of the straight line yeah. and yeah. the curve. You might yeah. get both in. Right, end of day one two digs to do tomorrow. See you after the break. Oh, and uh, don't forget, armies are more often destroyed by starvation than battle, and hunger is more savage than the sword. It's time yes, for our dinner. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See you after the break. Thank you. That. <laughs> <laughs> Day two, and we're excavating the Roman stone tower and the defensive ditch. But why did the Romans need such a big ditch to protect them when they'd already got the river Ribble and the big fort? Well, I'll hazard a guess, but I don't know if I'm right. When the Romans invaded, not all the Britons were their enemies. Just like the Americans in Vietnam, the Romans set up a series of client states and the local chieftain round here, the Brigantian Queen Carter Mandua, was definitely pro-Roman. In fact, she was so much on the Roman side that when the Celtic chief Caractacus begged asylum from her, she shopped him and turned him over to the Romans. But her husband Venusius led an anti-Roman faction, and although there was an uneasy truce between husband and wife, eventually, inevitably, I suppose, there was a messy divorce, and to make matters worse, Queen Cartamandua got off with her ex-husband's armour-bearer. Uh, as you can imagine, this meant that Venusius completely forgot all about the truce, and he immediately set up a full-scale uprising against the Romans. And it was this Brigantian uprising that completely changed Roman attitudes towards their defence from the Britons. Up till now, they'd relied on small armies and temporary fortresses, but from now on, there were going to be massive standing armies and big fortresses. So, I reckon, if we can get a date on this ditch, we'll find that it was dug round about the time of the Brigantian Uprising. Anyway, that's what I think at uh, 8.32 on Saturday morning. 
but there's still 36 hours to go, so we'll just have to see if the archaeology bears me out. Oh, you're not still eating your breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> the first chance I've had. <laughs> this is Adrian Olivier from Hi. the Lancaster University Archaeology Unit. Yeah. Remember we talked about some work that was done when the sheltered housing was put up. And Adrian yeah. did that work. But you'll probably get a shock when you look round because last night we talked about one trench across the corner over there. And we've had a change of heart because we think if there was a tower on that corner, it would hang on. <laughs> it would be a shame to disturb it, right? It'd be better to leave it, and conserve it, and leave it intact. I thought archaeologists were supposed to dig up the most exciting things, not ignore them and go somewhere else. No, no, yeah. no, not at all. So what we're trying to do now is to cut uh, a trench across the line that the geophysics chaps found. Now I've got the map here. If I can just show you, look. We like that. Hang on. Show the camera. Right, like that. We've got this trench out over there, yep. and this trench, with nobody in it at the moment, out over there. Yep. Okay, and we're leaving the corner, because if there's a tower on there, it'd be nice to just leave it for, for the future. But how about this as an idea, that if this is the stone fort with the river cutting through it, the church in the middle, Jim's tower in the corner, we're up in this field here with these two ditches being dug. What about this as part of what was a much bigger fort originally, or even a much bigger fort, with the road coming through like that. I don't think it's necessarily a fort, yeah. because the, the civil settlement around it might have a higher status by the virtue of having defences. Right. So what we're saying is that it is some sort of ditch to protect something. Yeah. We're yeah. not actually sure what it is, but you think that it might be it, to it, protect this massive fort you've just possible invented. It might be a fort, yeah, which we've just invented, <laughs> or it might be around the civil settlement. And then what we need is some dating evidence, yeah. really, to... Well, let's and and if it's around the civil settlement, then it might mean that that settlement itself has a much higher status. Yeah. More of a town, perhaps, yeah. than just a village. Yeah. Okay. I've got this brilliant theory that this big ditch could have been dug around about the time of the Brigantian uprising. AD 70, something like that, in, in order to uh, <laughs> right. to make sure that, uh, you know, the, the Brigantians didn't uh, come charging into the fort. Do you think there's any possibility of that? It's a great story and there's always a possibility, but uh, <laughs> uh, no, no evidence. <laughs> there's no evidence to anything that Mick said. As far as any of us know, what Mick said might be a load of bollocks, but you allowed that. <laughs> right, OK. <laughs> Well, what yeah. we've what we've got, um, as you as you can see, we've got the the cobbling coming up on the other side, oh, yeah. which is probably uh -huh. the the foundation for yeah, the main frontage of the of, of the wall. Of cobbles, yeah. And again on the back side, and then you'll notice on the back further corner, we've got some clay rising yeah. up. You can see a distinct and line beginning that's to right. appear. And, it, and it, it, yeah. it appears in the base of the trench as well, virtually right oh, the way yes. across. Yeah. And that is almost certainly the original clay of the old wooden fort. The in other words, the earliest, fort. the early yeah. pre-stone wooden fort um, Very into which the stone fort was superimposed. I see. And what we're hoping to do now, mm. what we want to do now mm. is to take most of the diggers away from here now yes and take them over to the where we've been doing the geophysics survey yeah would we'll do two excavations through that yeah. and try and pick up the line of the ditch over there that's excellent smashy what this this clay sort of subsoil i mean it doesn't look terribly exciting i know it, it, effectively it's part of the rampart of the defenses that we think was demolished cut down at some point and then spread flat over the field. How do you know it's not just ordinary clay lying under the earth? Because I saw it before in 1980. <laughs> oh, well, when you dug before. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. The other thing while we're here um, is uh, when you look out in that direction, I wonder whether that wasn't perhaps marshy or streams or something out there in the past. Yeah, it's possible. Although, again, in 1980, we did find traces of features going, going off in that direction. And I think certainly your idea that 
that before the fort mm. there were perhaps lots of other camps is, is a good idea whether how these defenses relate to it we don't know so we've got three digs now these two and the one at jim's yeah and it's and in fact i mean the sort of the turf construction that we were talking about here is exactly the same as the clay that you'd see in jim's garden the, the clay underneath the stone corner tower is the clays of the earlier rampart of the fort using the same techniques. It's brilliant. I haven't even seen this other dig yet. I'll go and have a look <laughs> so, at that. I mean, right. In fact, we, we, we probably don't need to do any more in Jim's garden, I think, because we've, we've come to the Roman rampart under the tower. And I think rather than hack all that out and, and, and again, wreck it, you know, I think we, we will clean that up and draw it and, and, and stop at that point. What's in, what's in his tower, in fact, is, is the rampart of a, of a, of a turf-built fort underneath. Well, I think I'd like to see it before you I'm make a final decision <laughs> to stop. <laughs> I think we'll stop working on it. Okay, we'll see, see you later. later. See you. See you. So things are moving quickly, almost too quickly for me, but it's good news because we're actually answering the second part of Jim's letter. His own garden has now produced further evidence of the earlier phase of Roman activity. Amazingly, he's got two forts, not just the one. This is Victor's reconstruction of how the stone guard tower would have stood in Jim's garden. Now I suppose what would be useful is a picture of how the wooden fort might have looked. I think it's amazing that you've got all these Roman stones here. I wish I had something like this in my back garden. Yes, you can see the width of the rampart and you can see how it follows a curve with these plinth stones in position. So it goes right under your house? Right underneath the house, underneath the back kitchen and 15 feet up, exactly where you walk down to the bathroom, that's where the Roman soldiers would patrol. So you think about them every morning, do well, you? Well, yes, emotions? I do. I have a meditation about ancient yeah. Rome every morning, yes. You may have noticed that uh, there doesn't seem to be all that much activity going around here anymore. Well, I think we've gone as far as we can go, really, yeah. and it's answered some very interesting questions. For example, we have the floor level here. And this, presumably, down here is... Um, the, the previous fort. Yes, this clay seems to be associated with the earlier fort and uh, I'm sure that we'll find out much more from these very interesting developments further north. So as Carenza starts to transfer the survey information onto her map, one of the first things to do is to highlight Jim's garden and accurately position the remains of both the stone guard tower and the earlier wooden fort. But the focus for the weekend now turns to this field. Will our two trenches locate the defensive ditch? Does it run across the field as the geophysics survey suggested? And will it date to the same period as the wooden fort? The geophysics team, meanwhile, are busy scanning adjacent fields, hoping to find the ditch continuing along the same line. Well, I think we're getting on very well over here. Good God, Al, that's ordered a bit, isn't it? Oh God, Al, what you got here then? Well, it's easy if you drop down in the trench and I'll show you. Yeah. So, what you've got here, where the cobbles are, right. is a cobble foundation for a rampart. Right. The cobbles start here, and go right. under, but the rampart starts here. Right. Very solid grey clay, right. forming the front of the rampart, and then all the loose material retained by it at the back, where right. it gets browner. So, in fact, everything here you would have had in this enormous bank here That's then, now the whole exactly lot's right. been slighted, ploughed, all to pieces. That's exactly right. Good yeah. Lord, Al, there ain't much left of that. Nope. And you come along and you've got a, a flat part of berm in front of the rampart. Right, yeah. And it drops off down oh, into the wow, ditch. Oh, wow, that's which... something else, isn't it, eh? But look at that, just right at the end of the trench. And it always the same. Every what time. What are you going to do about it then, Adrian? I think we need to extend. I think we... I reckon we got yeah. the got the time. I think we can afford to do that. Yeah, we need to get the other side of the ditch. Yeah? Right this way. That, that looks convincing to me. <laughs> These are a few people I think you ought to meet. <laughs> they look absolutely fantastic, <laughs> don't they? keeping something up your sleeve. Oh, <laughs> no wonder right. the Brigantes right. lost. <laughs> wow. Hello there, Chris. Hello. This is Tony and Robin. Hello, Tony. Uh, hi. And uh, I thought they ought to hi. meet some sort of genuine Roman soldiers, okay. Roman legionaries. Okay. The thing about the Ermine Street Guard is yeah. that they are authentic and archaeologists conventional archaeologists like me have a tremendous respect for them because of the authenticity. And uh, is this punk headdress, is that, <laughs> uh, is that for real? 
Yeah, that's totally correct. The Centurions always wore them across the helmet, as you can see, not from front to back. And that would uh, made of horse hair. That's great. Yeah, yeah. Let's yeah. look at uh, yeah. a private. Oh. <laughs> a melee's. A, a what? A melee's. Well, ordinary soldier. Ordinary soldier. You put your shield down. Now, you can see the. Um, Vegetius yeah. says, "Let the adolescent who is to be selected for martial activity have alert eyes, straight <laughs> neck, broad chest, muscular shoulders, strong arms, long fingers. Let him be small in the stomach, slender in the buttocks." and have calves <laughs> and feet that are not swollen by surplus fat, but firm with hard muscle. When you see these points in a recruit, you needn't greatly regret the absence of tall stature. <laughs> I like that sentiment. <laughs> What's this little bag? This is basically a ma marching, um, marching pack, yeah. which each man would have carried. It would have carried three days worth of corn in this bag, a cloak probably in this bag, along with his own personal effects and cooking pots. And was it? So it's really it's like a kit bag? But yeah. And then you'd carry it over your carry shoulder? Carry it over your shoulder, yeah. Can you talk <laughs> us through the, the armour as well, Chris? Because, you know, this is all based yeah. on excavated bits and pieces right. and so on, and, 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 you know, carvings and all well, the rest of it. Looking then at the equipment of the legionary soldier, by this time you've got this imperial Gallic helmet is developed. You can see with large cheek pieces to cover the sides of his face, yeah. large neck guard at the rear of the helmet, and here we got a reinforcement which would help to take sword blows if they came down at the yeah. front. The body armour is based on a, an exciting find that was made at Corbridge on Hadrian's Wall. Uh, it's called Lorica Segmentata. Mm -hmm. Simply means you've got segments of metal which are joined together internally, if you can see, with on oh, leather straps. Leather straps. Mm -hmm. And this makes mm -hmm. the armour flexible and means yeah. that the soldier can, can move about quite easily inside it. Yeah. He's got a military belt around the bottom of the armour and at the front of the belt is this apron which everybody talks about which is perhaps more for decoration but maybe maybe psychological to, <laughs> to protect the lower stomach and private parts yeah, although we yeah. find that the protection is more psychological than practical. <laughs> You can see it's quite easy to draw the Nearly sword killed the cameraman. <laughs> on that side. And that means that uh, you can keep your shield nice and tight to the body and not have to move the shield away to draw the sword. It's an incredibly outlandish costume. and It actually must have felt as outlandish to the Britons then as it does to us now. I can imagine if you were just uh, you know, working away in your hut and you suddenly saw five blokes like this coming over the horizon, you would be really freaked out, wouldn't you? It certainly would have been intimidating, yeah. yes. That's yeah. the word I was looking for. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> okay! Ite! Sin! 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 Certainly very sin. impressive, and it does really help to visualise things as they might have been. But we thought we'd go one step further. Their equipment is as authentic as it can be, but does it work? We asked them to have a go at digging a defensive ditch using the same kind of tools that the Roman soldiers would have used in 70 AD. thing from my point of view is that we are actually finding Roman stuff in our trenches. Yeah. I think this is brilliant. I know you're always so snippy about actual finds. Well, but I think this, is... <laughs> <laughs> this was a nuisance to get out the trench. What yeah. is it? Well, it's probably the top of a Roman quern. That is a hand mill. Presumably you get this sort of thing yeah. common, do you, Adrian? Yeah. Made out of millstone grit, so it's yeah. fairly local stone. And it's obviously been broken. It's not complete, so presumably it got broken and then was just chucked away after they put in all this work. They gave, they gave yeah, up and just abandoned it, yeah. And you found some but, uh, yeah, pottery getting, with panels well, on? Uh, Phil's getting a lot of Samian, you know, we're getting a lot of... This is the high-quality Roman stuff out of the trench, which, again, you must get a lot of. Yeah, in, in the museum's full of it. Yeah, yeah. it's lovely stuff. It's got this lovely red slip, uh, you know, over the top of it, and it's decorated, this piece, a lot of it is. But this doesn't actually help us with Jim's letter and the yeah. question which is about the defences. Yeah. But the Too trenches far. aren't actually giving us the information which we hoped they'd give last night. We don't know that these two are, are similar yet until yeah. we look at the ditch mm. profiles and the finds from them. We don't know that's similar. I mean, I think 
what it looks as if we may have here is two parts of possibly two forts yeah. as well as the stone fort as well as the the fort <laughs> no hang on <laughs> this is the four fort yeah well that's not unusual because wherever these areas are dug you get marching camps temporary camps they demolish a place they relay another lot out there's another lot of trouble they send another lot of troops in they build another one and you end up with these quite sort of stack of sort of playing card shaped forts all over the place. Is it a place called... second fort. At the moment it seems to me that what we've got is the possibility of little bits of, of a whole variety of forts all over the area that we've been yeah. looking at. Yeah. But at six o'clock tomorrow we've got yeah. to make a presentation <coughs> to people and yeah. incidentally we're supposed to be making a television program <laughs> oh, at yes, the end yes, of yes, which hopefully we've got some coherent yeah. evidence. Well we can't work on all of these we just haven't got the resources so what can we do in order to to, to try and make yeah. sure that we've got something tangible. Well, uh, we've talked about this, and I think what we've decided is that we're going to carry on with this one and, and go down, because... Yeah. We want I, some dating evidence yeah. from the ditch. Agent's yeah. happy with that. This one, we think we should go for the stone layer and see if there's a ditch under it. We'll, it'll either have a bank and a ditch, or it won't. Either way, if we think it'll be useful <laughs> to us. <laughs> Even the amount of time that it took today to dig those two trenches, yeah. if we continue digging both of them, uh, don't we run the risk of doing three quarters of two jobs rather than simply doing one job well? No, I don't think so. I think we have the capacity to do both, and we need answers from both, yeah. both questions. Yeah. Yeah. But what I'm trying to prove, and so obviously you've got to fit your evidence around this hypothesis, <laughs> is that there was a big expansion of defences at the time of the Brigantian Revolt. Do you think you can help me out on that? I think that's possible. If we, we need the dating evidence from the bottom of there to see whether we're in the same sort of period. And we, we, you know, we get that tomorrow, we hope. Great. So just hang on. Yeah. Just hang on. <laughs> yeah. Nearly there. <laughs> Day three, it's a beautiful morning, but all our lovely theories of the last 48 hours have gone right out of the window. That's archaeology for you. If you remember, in the pub, the geophysics boys drew this purple line, and we thought that that might mean that there were the remains of some Roman defence system going all the way around here. So we dug a trench here, which is that one there, and sure enough, we came to some remains of uh, a Roman defence structure. But when we dug round here, in this trench, which is sort of there, we didn't find any such remains at all. In fact, probably this curve round here isn't anything to do with uh, archaeological material. It's probably clay or something like that. If you look on this magnetometry printout, you can see that it looks as though the main line goes down like that. There doesn't really seem to be much of a curve. So what we're going to do is to dig a little test trench there to try and see whether this line of defences goes straight rather than curving round, which is what I suggested it might do in the pub, you might remember, but uh, I don't want to crow about that, do I? This is stuff that you found, what, in, in, in the, the village, river. Tim? Or down, by the down by the river, right, OK. Oh, well, that's all right. I think we know what that is. That is almost certainly the top of a big amphora jar. I think the best thing is if I draw it for you. This would be the top, like that, and then it would sort of go something like that. Mm -hmm. Sometimes with a big handle on, sometimes with two handles on. And the way to think of these is as a sort of packing crate of so the Roman period, because the, the main things that came in in them were oil and wine, an horrible smelly fish sauce called garum, which they used to spread on bread. Mm. Rotten fish, that was. Mm. And then when it was empty, of course, they would use it for storage. And what you've got there, that bit there, is, is the top lip, like that. So it would have stood about that sort of height, up like that. Yeah, this looks just about the right, right place then, because you've got a good line that goes straight the way down there. Um, so, yeah, I mean, good, good place to dig. And, uh, well, about five hours. Do you reckon we can get some in five hours? 
Yes, I think no problem. Well, let's hope anyway. Well, that's right. Kath seems confident, so fingers crossed. And the Ermine Street Guard are making good progress. But what about our other excavation, Trench 2, which failed to find the defences? Was that a waste of time? Well, apparently not, because what we have here are signs of occupation. This is the trench where the quern was found. But most significant of all is this post hole from a timber building. This is clear evidence of a settlement and fits in with the theory that the ditch we're looking for might have been built to protect the area outside the fort. I tell you what muddles me, every time you talk about the ditch, I think of this long trench here. That's a ditch, isn't it? Well, not really. This is, this is the limit of our excavation, the rect rectangular box. Yeah. The Roman ditch, you can see running across the excavation, and that's the top of the Roman ditch. Well, that, that guy's shoveling there. That's absolutely right, yeah. Now, what's happened here is we're looking, effectively, at the surviving bit of rampart that would have defended whatever was back here behind the ditch. And they laid down the foundation of cobbles right the way across to give a firm footing. Yeah. Then they cut the turfs from off the top of the ditch and stacked them there. And you can just see the bottom of the vertical face. So the rampart would have risen like that. And then the, the spoil from the ditch, the soil, would have been piled behind the rampart here. So effectively, you've got a ditch that people fall into, and then they climb out of the ditch and they walk into a killing ground. Hang on. <laughs> so the, your enemy is charging across the field. And they have to drop down into this deep ditch, which is obviously much deeper than it is now. Yeah. Ah! And then they scramble up the other scramble side here. onto this bit that you've yeah. eloquently called the killing field. It's the berm. We call it the berm. Yeah. And then there are people standing on the rampart throwing nasty pointed things so at them. So th <laughs> then they have to try and scrabble up yes. onto the turf. Well, <laughs> it's a bit higher than that. It's, a, it's about this high originally. So where you are is as far as, as they would have got. So then what would happen to well, them? Well, they'd be dead. <laughs> <laughs> So, in fact, they, they'd be looking, fighting upwards like this. Yeah. 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 Well, gee, I have a fairly good height advantage over you anyway, yeah. already. <laughs> <laughs> so we're depending on Kath. Can she find the other end of this defensive ditch? And can Phil, who's helping out in Trench 1, find any datable evidence by digging a bit deeper? At least everyone now agrees that this should be the right line to dig. Even the geophysics lot, whose survey of the next field showed signs of the line continuing in that direction. The geophysics team have now turned their attention to tracing the outline of the early wooden fort. These are the first two grids, and we've now actually done a large area. And... Cool! It's, oh, it's great, isn't it? Um, Looks like a Roman villa, doesn't it? It does look... I mean, we, we actually a, thought it was a Roman villa. I mean, is this not, a, you know, one of these apsidal things on a bathhouse? Um, no, it's, the... um, it's a playing field. The weekend's not getting any easier for the geophysics. The constant application of lime when marking out the pitch has altered the structure of the soil. But they are picking up traces of something else slightly deeper. What they have to do now is suppress the pitch information and try and get a clear picture of the archaeology underneath. So how are we going to explain the fact that we've got this network of seemingly unconnected Roman trenches and earthworks and things? Well, I think you've got to, you've got to realise that we're talking about different stages of development and responding to possibly changed situations. So you've got uh, people having second thoughts about how to deal with the problem that surrounded them. Uh, and we're obviously hoping to get dating evidence uh, for at least one of those stages uh, this weekend. So you'd have different fashions of military defence? That's right, that's right. And not only that, you've got to remember that these stages are separated by, what, 20, 30, sometimes 50 years, and so it's a different bloke who's arrived to take charge and has different solutions to the problem that faces him. They were always ready for disaster. Uh, I suppose every Roman general, bearing in mind uh, disasters of the past, was determined that it wasn't going to be put down to him if he got a surprise attack or a surprise ambush in the middle of the night. He was going to make jolly sure that it didn't look bad on his CV. Yeah, that's changed again, Adrian, from what it was. Totally different shape. Yeah, every five minutes it changes. Yeah. Yeah. But this is the last time, because I think we've just actually got the bottom now. And what have you got? Well, it's the same sort of sequence that we saw earlier. I mean, there are three... There are three ditches, or at least three phases to this ditch. But what we've, what we've just discovered by, by cleaning back this section is that where we thought earlier on this afternoon that it might be a military ditch, and now I'm absolutely convinced, because it's got a very distinctive profile. If you, if you sort of 
look down the side here, we have a virtually vertical edge down the face that's presented to the attackers, and then a much more gentle slope, a sort of asymmetrical profile, and that's also in the Roman military manuals. And it's called a Punic profile ditch. Punic ditch? Yep. Mm. And I'm absolutely convinced that this earliest phase of ditch, therefore, is, is a military ditch. And what was different about a Punic ditch? Why did they dig it that way? It's just, a, it's just a yet another means of keeping people at bay and making life more difficult for them as they, as they approach the rampart. It means they fall they down fall. a steep slope, yeah. and then they're wide open for attack off the rampart down come up the, the shallow slope, slope mm. if they're pinned against the back. Yeah. Is there any date connotation to that, Adrian? Not really, no, no. I don't think so. I mean I, I mean, I suppose I'd say they were earlier rather than later. Yeah. And Great! <laughs> <laughs> but I'm always optimistic. <laughs> what about any finds to help date it for us? I'm afraid not. I mean, from, the lower, from this lower military ditch, which this is what survives of it, I'm afraid it's completely sterile in terms of finds. We've got a few pieces of undiagnostic Roman pottery, Samian and Corsware, from the later recut, which you see is completely different in character, because it's a much yeah. broader yeah. and slightly shallower um, ditch with this primary silting in the bottom. Mm. And we, uh, so, I mean, we can, all, we can say that that's Roman, but I'm afraid that doesn't yeah. help us very much, because we knew it was Roman anyway. Yeah. I wish we found a coin. Oh, you are a misery. <laughs> <laughs> Never satisfied. <laughs> We may not be able to date this Punic ditch, but it's fantastic that we have some more evidence from the early period of Roman activity. And we have the ditch dug by the Ermine Street Guard, which is now finished. It may be small, but it's been a worthwhile exercise because it allows the archaeologists to see a ditch dug with authentic Roman tools. And this will help them understand the rotted turf remains which they encounter during an excavation. All we need to do now is to find out whether the Punic ditch carries on in a straight line. Was I right? Well, I feel quite embarrassed here, actually, because both of you on independent occasions suggested this is where the ditch would be, and we all wanted it to go across the field. So now it's here, Kath. What have you got? Well, we've got the, the outer edge of the ditch sloping down there. You, um, it was seen earlier, a very, very slight slope. There's still some fill in the bottom underneath the black and white pole, but now it's, what, nearly three o'clock? It seems yeah. about time to pack in and record it. And you'd so. have to take the trench a lot further back to get the bottom of the ditch. To get the bottom of the you're ditch, You're confident yeah. this is the same as what Adrian's got on the other side? Absolutely Adrian. confident. Yeah. I mean, the, yeah. the material in it's exactly the same. You have Great. that then? <laughs> I'm, I'm over the moon. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right then, Jim. Absolutely. We're nearly there, Fantastic. I think. Yes. Just with the, the, you know, literally the last hour to go, yeah. we may well be just be able to give you some answer to that letter now. So just enough time to get ready for the presentation. The line of the Punic Ditch can now be added to our archaeological map of Ribchester. By examining the map, it's clear to see that this line joins up with the others found by the geophysics team and Carenza during her survey. So what we have is one big defensive ditch running around the town. The Punic Ditch is contemporary with the wooden fort found under the stone fort in Jim's garden. This is Victor's picture of the stone fort which we've seen earlier. But Victor has now prepared another sequence which helps to show how it would have looked. Brilliant stuff. But Jim actually has the remains of two forts on his premises, and this is Victor's reconstruction of the earlier wooden fort. Jim will also be able to see Victor's impression of how this fort would have looked in his garden. The geophysics team are hurrying to get ready. Their work at the playing field site hasn't been wasted. They believe they've discovered Roman roads associated with the early fort. All of these will then have to be included on this picture which will show the various phases of Roman activity. The Punic Ditch, the line of the wooden fort discovered in 1989, the Roman bathhouse, and the outline of the early wooden and later stone fort. Right, you'll see how heavy it is. It's quite heavy. 
Well, it's five past six. All the local people are here, so uh, let's find out what the archaeologists have got to say. This is a sum total, then, Jim, of all that we've got, your garden, all the previous excavations, geophysics areas and so on. You, you have Very impressive. That, I am indeed, yeah. yes. How remarkable in such a short time. I wish they'd come and do it to my village. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what is it that you're so excited about? Because for me as a layman, we just dug two trenches in a ditch and one of them didn't seem to have much in anyway. Well, even, even that's interesting. But I mean, we've actually gone into a field that we know very little about and it's, everywhere we've, we've dug, we've found Roman features. I mean, that in itself is, is just brilliant. We've looked at the defences that we found in 1980 again, but we've got new information about them. We've been able to excavate a bit more of them. And the idea that the first phase of them, with this Punic ditch, is military and then perhaps modified perhaps 50 years, 10 years, we don't know, later, as civilian defences, perhaps. We're on a whole new track of thought about Rochester and our understanding and how the whole thing fits together. We've got the network of Roman roads. There's a Roman road that goes right across here, right down here. This is the, the approximate line of this curving round. You've then got the river coming round here, so you've got the whole area sort of naturally protected on the intersection of the two Roman roads there and the river, which apparently is navigable up to this point and probably was yes. at that date. So, you know, it's an ideal place to put it. It's an easily defendable point. Now, according to our archaeologists, they've totally rewritten the history of the defences of ancient Ribchester in just three days. We haven't found anything to tie the archaeology into the Brigantian revolt, but I think that was probably a bit too optimistic. Although, having said that, we have found the temporary fortress underneath the big stone fortress, so that isn't such a bad start. But more importantly, up until today, everyone thought that the big ancient ditch around Ribchester was a simple, harmless civic ditch that had probably been put up for show or just to keep the cows in. But we now know that it's a Roman Punic ditch that was put up probably in quite a hurry around a large, irregular area for defence. So whereas before our picture of the outskirts of Ribchester would have been simple farmers toiling away at their fields, we must now start thinking about it as burly Roman guards looking nervously behind them, looking a bit like the Ermine Street guard, terrified that they get a spear in their backs from some angry local warrior. And I think you'll agree that's a pretty different proposition.